I'd like to call to order the Clarkston Independence District Library Board of Trustee meeting for February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. we'll call it to order at 6.32. Let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Dan Gaffney? Here. Dan Green? Absent. Allison McFadden-Hewson? Here. Nancy Moon? Here. Marilyn Pomeroy? Here. Ann Rose? Here. Chris Schell? Here. Julie Murphy? Here. Excellent. All right, I will accept a motion to approve the agenda. So I move. Who's moving? I'm sorry, I, I thought you were. Ann moved. Yeah. Yeah. Allison seconded. Sorry. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda as presented. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion is approved. This is the moment for the call to the public. Tonight, the public is staying home. Laura <laughs> <laughs> let me know she was unavailable this evening. Okay. So, we will close the call to the public, and we'll move to the 10-item consent agenda. I'll accept the motion. I'll move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. I'll second. We move seconded that we accept the consent agenda as, as presented. We have 10 items. Anybody need to discuss any one of those? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Agenda is approved as presented. Library statistics. So because it's so early in the year, there are not a lot of statistics to talk about. But um, these numbers are starting to look more like um, Pre-COVID numbers, we're pleased about that. Circulation is um, increasing and visits to the library are increasing, so we're seeing um, some improvement there. And we had a Valentine's party on Saturday, and we had great turnout for that, so we're very pleased about that as well. Good. Okay, any questions or comments about statistics? We just have more every month. <laughs> Uh, the library director's report. Okay. Um, so the first item, um, the library's formal fine-free status has been in place for approximately a month. The system of notifying patrons of overdue materials they still have checked out for which other patrons are waiting on hold um, has been working really, really well. So in um, week one, there were 25 overdue in-demand items. After phone calls, seven um, still needed to be returned. Um, and now only one is still out. Great. And then in week two, 14 overdue in-demand items. Um, after the phone calls, four still needed to be returned, and now only two are still out. Uh, so patrons who have been notified that an item is overdue with another patron waiting have seven days to return the item from the time they get their phone call. If the item is not returned, the account is billed for the item, thus blocking that account from checking out more items. If the billed item is returned, the fees are waived, and the account is unblocked. This system focuses on the key goal, which is assuring that materials are circulating to patrons smoothly, specifically targeting materials that have other patrons waiting. The consequence of not returning an in-demand item in a timely fashion is the inability to check out anything else until that item is returned or ultimately replaced. So um, this, I think, has um, addressed what the problem was, and it seems to be working well. <coughs> Uh, the next item, um, the school mask requirement in Oakland County will end on February 28th. Um, within that email from Oakland County, um, they did state that the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and Oakland County Health Division recommends masking indoors and in crowded settings. For school, the CDC and MDHHS recommend universal indoor masking by all students ages two years old and older staff, teachers, and visitors to K-12 schools, regardless of vaccination status. Um, so they are lift, lifting the mandate, but they are still recommending that people mask indoors. So the library currently has staff wearing masks regardless of vaccination and encouraging but not requiring the public to wear masks in the building. 
KN95 masks are available to the staff and surgical masks are also available in the public areas of the building. And at this point, that's we're going to stick with that until we see that um, those recommendations have been changed. Okay. Um, last item on my report, in past years, uh, the library has hosted an annual day-long staff training event that was shared with the neighboring library. COVID has made that difficult, but training is still important. One of the trainers that was a staff favorite a few years ago, Pat Wagner, will be retiring in 2023 and has decided to offer a series of webinars of her best content, 13 different topics, over the course of this year. We were able to negotiate discount pricing and will be taking advantage of Pat's decades of library expertise by having each staff member attend at least one of these webinars and providing the opportunity to attend up to three. Staff may choose the sessions and can attend the live or recorded version depending on their work schedule. They may also make arrangements with their supervisor to participate in the sessions from home if that provides a more con conducive environment for viewing a webinar. We do have people who work at service desks that they don't really have a, a place to do that. <laughs> staff may check out a library laptop from the IT department if needed. At each all staff meeting this year, we will provide some time for the people who attended each webinar to share with the rest of the staff key elements that they thought were most useful. We hope to reinstate our day-long training, but in the meantime, this provides a flexible option by a presenter we know that the staff has enjoyed in the past. Excellent. That's our creative way of doing it this year. <laughs> That's great. If we have an opportunity between now and the end of the year to do something day long, we may do that, but at this point we're just looking for creative solutions. <clears throat> Excellent idea. Ah, now, regular business. The review of the state aid report. Uh, so public libraries in Michigan are formally established under state law and must file a report with the Library of Michigan each year in order to maintain their certification. The certification verifies the library's eligibility for state aid funds, penal fine money, and governmental grants. Filing season begins in October and has an electronic filing deadline of February 1st, 2021. Within your packet, you will find the state aid report that was submitted for this year. Because the library has a different fiscal year than the state of Michigan, January to December versus October to September, the report that was just submitted covers January 1 to December 31 of 2020. So this is old data. So, <laughs> so I'm not going to dwell on it too much, and we did talk about it because they're actually in the report that we submitted last year were some COVID questions. And interestingly, a lot of the stuff that is most uh, that was most useful was in addition submitted last year because they wanted it sooner. Um, so this report felt very repetitious. Um, they are adding some new questions this year, um, which means we have to figure out how to gather that data. So they announced the questions and then we need to get, have it for 2021 data for next year. And they do give us a reprieve that if, if we haven't collected it as of yet, we can say we didn't have the data to provide. Sometimes we can backtrack, sometimes we can't depending on what it is they're asking for. And um, so we're in the process right now of looking at 2021 with these new questions to see if there's a way to estimate some of those numbers or if there's a way we can discern what they are. Um, so that's the big thing with the state aid report right now is now we're collecting all the data. Usually January, February, March, I collect all the data from 2021. And then when that October filing season opens, I already have it ready to go. Mm -hmm. And it makes it really easy. So. I just have one comment because it struck me as very interesting on the interlibrary loans that mm -hmm. the number we loaned out and the number we took in were within four books of one another. <laughs> so that's, it's really interesting that that happens and part of the reason that happens is because MALCAT, the system that we use, has a formula by which they load balance. Oh, okay. So they well, purposefully, yeah. yep, so it, and I know you're a MAL user, so when you go in and you say, you want the first available, you know, you, you just pick one, pick a library. Sometimes they let you hand pick your library. Yeah. Sometimes they pick it for you. When they pick it for you, that's when they do that load balance. Okay. I just, I just, I was like, wow, that's crazy. I know. Yeah. Their system used to be a little, we used to loan more than we took, than in. We took in. And um, the last few years, it's been getting tighter and tighter. So they're, they're well, algorithm. I'm doing my part to. Uh, <laughs> their, their algorithm is getting really good. So. Yeah, yeah I, I was fascinated by that, but that does explain it. Yeah, I'm glad I on it. I am too, because that was one of the, I would not have thought of that as being the interesting piece to pull out. <laughs> so I'm glad that you found something that was of interest to ask about. If we had any 
certification changes of our staff. Most of the staff that we hire is certified when they get here. Um, let's see. Is there any new? I have one in training right now, but she wouldn't be listed as a librarian yet. And right. So by this is yep. 2020. Yep. So by the time by the time we list her next year, I believe that she would be she would be added to the librarian list and then get her certification. Right now, we have her on staff as an intern, and we're we're allowing her to shadow at the information desk and that sort of thing. So. A lot of times, people don't don't. Um, apply to have their certification changed unless they have a reason to want to. So as soon as you finish your library degree, you're a level two librarian. And then after um, four years of full-time ex work experience or the, or the equivalent in part-time work experience, you can apply to the library of Michigan and get your level one. Um, most people, unless they want to be a director, don't have a reason to need level one certification. So if they decide they're going to apply they might for a director position, they might do that. Um, we encourage people to do that, and it will help them do that. But a lot of times, if they don't need to, they just leave themselves at level two. Okay. Any other questions about this report? It's interesting. We tried to do our homework. <laughs> You're good. I'm glad. I'm glad you got a chance to read through it. All right. <clears throat> so let's move on to number two. Okay, so um, on February 2nd and 3rd, southeastern Michigan experienced a snow event that was predicted to be quite significant throughout the entire area. The weather was anticipated to include ice on Wednesday morning, followed by heavy snow from mid-morning through midday on Thursday. Uh, normally, we decide how to respond to inclement weather each morning based on the road conditions in Clarkston and the ability of the staff to get to Clarkston who live outside the immediate area. In other words, if too many staff can't make it to work, we may close the library due to lack of coverage. Because the storm was supposed to be so widespread and many of our staff live further afield, uh, we decided to close the library on Wednesday and Thursday, as some of our neighboring libraries were doing. However, our library's emergency closure policy is written to reflect the type of closure that we usually have, which involves accumulating snow over the course of the workday, indicating a need to send the staff home early. When part-time staff are already at the library, we pay them for the remainder of their shift. In this case, the part-time staff were not already at the library, so the policy would indicate that they would not be paid for their shifts. Because we closed two days, this placed a significant financial burden on our valuable part-time employees. I would propose a one-time override of the current emergency closure policy and pay the part-time employees who were scheduled to work on Wednesday, February 2nd and Thursday, February 3rd. In 2022, we will be working on a project to review all employee policies, and this policy could be updated to reflect various strategies for addressing inclement weather. And the wages, uh, the wage budget is um, able to accommodate the situation. Right. And Julie and I did discuss that mm -hmm. before we did this, and based on the weather reports, you know, then, like you said, it only takes a one degree or a little shift, and it looked like it shifted. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the Thursday, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But on the schools, were still bad on Friday. Right. Yeah, in I the had, back roads. I had to override. We have a policy that states if the schools are closed for inclement weather, then we automatically cancel our staff meeting. We had an all-staff meeting on Friday. And I actually had to email the staff and, because the school announced that they were closing the schools due to issues with the back roads, not with inclement weather. So I had to email the staff and say, hey guys, this is, it technically is not inclement weather. We're going to go ahead and have our staff meeting on Friday. And people were great. They all showed up and they were ready to get back to it. Uh, but I did have to kind of override it. The policies are not always able to <laughs> adequately reflect what's actually going on thanks to Mother Nature being a little bit unpredictable. So. <laughs> well, in, in the first significant snow event of the year always results in the media declaring a major disaster. Whether the major disaster ends up occurring? Not always. You know, I said all of us can remember the time when we got two feet or whatever it was. Yeah. So yeah. We remember those days. Right. So we discussed that and based on the weather predictions, right. I, I concur and I think that I was, agree with Julie. It was one day at a time, we'll go back to that even with these big snow events and that way we can evaluate. You can adjust better to what actually happened as compared to what was 
predict, predict it because it's not always the same. But a lot of schools were closed to the second day, too. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. the right. CC was closed both Wednesday and Thursday. Absolutely. You know, so I, I think that you did it right. I, I did, did it perfectly. Thank right. You. Keep our people safe. <laughs> I think it's good. And, <laughs> and since the, if we had been open, the people that were on the schedule would have been paid. Mm -hmm. Clearly, there's no budget impact. Mm -hmm. right. So mm -hmm. I don't see any reason not to. Yeah. Well, it, at this point, it is. Um, it, our employees are very valuable and it is very easy for them to decide to go elsewhere and there are opportunities and so we want to make sure that we that they know their value here and that we want to keep them and that we are respectful of the fact that that is a financial burden on them. Right. And it wasn't their choice, it was ours. Right. So I don't, I don't see any problem with that. And I, I would move that we pay the part-time employees that were scheduled for those two days. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we pay our part-timers for the shifts that we closed down during our snow event. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, let's move to number three, discussion of COVID test kits. Okay. Um, in January 2022, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, MDHHS, initiated a pilot program to distribute COVID home test kits through public libraries and communities with underserved populations in areas with limited COVID testing sites. This involved 18 libraries and was a well-received program. Now MDHHS is expanding the program and inviting libraries to sign up to be distribution sites. The second round of libraries will, once again, focus on areas with limited COVID testing resources, but after that, MDHHS intends to make this program available to all libraries that want to participate. It was recommended by the library's attorney that the library board make the formal decision about whether the library signs up to participate in this program. Um, and I'll go ahead and review with you the program materials and feedback from um, libraries that participated in the first round of the program and input from the staff. Um, so it was interesting, the first meeting I went to about this, um, I'm, I'm going to be very honest about this, the library attorney who was at the meeting of you know, 300 and some library directors said, why on earth would you want to do this? You're inviting people who might be sick into your building, and you're not trained to handle these test kits or answer questions and all this kind of stuff. You really should have your library board make this decision. Um, in the meantime, libraries that had, had been signed on to this, those first 18 libraries, went through this whole process. And um, there were two meetings last week where I got to, to hear from some of those libraries and the feedback that they gave. So the first one, um, the library director said, I, I understand people's concern that it's a scary thing to say you're going to do this, but she said, honestly, the 300 test kits came. We announced to the public that we were going to distribute them via curbside, which we were already doing curbside. And she said, and they were gone in an hour and a half. And it was, we, were, we did it, it was great, the public community was happy about it, but then it was over, and she said, don't overthink this. So with that knowledge in hand, I went to the staff and I sat down with the department heads and I said, okay, this is, this is what, what's going on. And, uh, same thing I just told you. Um, and a couple of the department heads said, yep, this is great, we should definitely do this. And a couple of the department heads said, well, you know, let's make sure that the staff that would be distributing them um, have some feedback about how they're going to do this um, and whether they would be okay with it. And I've had a chance to talk to some, some people. And the reality is that by the time we go through yet another round of these test kit distributions, we're going to be in the third round, most likely, possibly even the fourth, depending on how much demand there is. Um, there will be many libraries ahead of us who will have this all figured out, so we will be able to do this in a, in a safe and responsible manner. So um, I feel like uh, what started out as an, oh my gosh, this is a, a mountain, is really turned into a molehill in terms of making this decision. Uh, as I said, I, I said to the staff that would be doing this, so we would be doing a curbside, we would be telling people the time that they could do this. We've been doing curbside all along. I feel like you've got the mechanism to do this, and many libraries will be able to say, do this, don't do that. And by the time we do this issue, we'll be able to think of the people. Plus, it's a nice extra perk for the community. Absolutely. Exactly. Well, and, and even though we're not clearly an underserved area because there are COVID test sites during the peak of everything right around the, the first of the year it was still very very difficult it was. to schedule a COVID test mm -hmm. here I mean we we um, 
had reason to have to do that, and it took it took five or six days before yeah. we could schedule anything. Absolutely. So you know, it would be nice to have had another option. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as it's done, because I certainly understand the concern you don't want to be inviting sick people into the building. Well, the, the other was there was a lot of fear that we would have to answer questions about the tests. And since then, MPHHS, and I put it in your board packet, provided an instruction material that was not in the original, that went out with the original test kits. They have since really talked to the Michigan Library Association and the Library of Michigan to create these instructions. And once I showed this to the staff, they were like, oh, this isn't a big deal. So I, they, there was, while there was concern, rightfully so. Oh, absolutely. Um, um, I, I think this has allayed all sorts of fears about this being a bigger deal than it needs to be. And each test kit has full well, instructions. Not, they do, but some, they, they can be a little confusing. Mm -hmm. And not everyone that's coming to think about who's sick in that moment either. Right. on it for like their kids are in school or absolutely like absolutely so this is uh 300 and then they're, they're doing them in batches of 300 okay. and they arrive but so one of the things that was really that that didn't sit very well was the fact that the pr went out that the libraries were going to get test kits and when the media picked it up they maybe didn't get all the details in that first round. So it sounded like all libraries were going to do it. So lots of libraries were getting phone calls that weren't getting tests, and the test hadn't been delivered yet. They picked it up a little bit too early in terms of telling people about it. Um, we've, we've all learned lessons, and um, now they're sending the kits and letting the libraries then tell the community at their own speed. So they could be in the building for a day or two while we figure out how we're going to shoot them. We can announce a date that we're going to do it. We, we have more control over how we would do that. Are you sending a limit? how many they can get? MDHHS sets the limit. Um, they're allowed to have one per person in the family per day. This is assuming that you're going to have them for days at a time, which from what, what I've been hearing from the other libraries, they're gone in an hour and a half. There isn't a <laughs> second day worth of dispensing. That's really going to be the problem. <laughs> Up to five. Okay. So there's an example right in, in the um, instructions that says if you if, some, if somebody comes up and says they have three people in their family, you give them three test kits. If they have eight people in their family, you give them five test kits because five is the max you can give anybody. So, yep, yep, that works. So, I mean, it's very, very easy. And there was also concern on the front end of it because they were trying to get to the underserved populations of how they were going to assure that they were going to the right people and the libraries were worried that they were going to be spending a lot of time double checking to make sure that this person is eligible and all of that kind yeah. of thing. And they've taken all of that out of the mix and say, nope, we're going to give you test kits. And if somebody says they need three, you give them three. If somebody says they need five, you give them five, move on. Yeah. So um, yeah. they're making it much simpler. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the test kits are quite so hard to get as they were in that first round. So. Okay, would you like a motion to this effect that we will participate? I believe I, I would if that's the direction that we want to sound like yes. it. That's my recommendation is that we go ahead and do the I do too. Okay. I think so. I okay. agree. I'll accept the motion. Um, I'll make a motion that um, our library participate in the um, COVID, COVID test kit distribution. I'll second. Okay. Nancy and Jan. So it's been moved and seconded that our library, CIDL, participate in the COVID test kit distribution down the line when we're when they're available for us. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's talk about ha, lawn maintenance. <laughs> I we need to appreciate lawn, that. Yes. <laughs> I knew you'd be excited to talk about lawn maintenance. <laughs> Uh, so in 2020, the Library Board approved a two-year contract with Michigan Outdoor Services uh, to provide lawn mowing and ground maintenance. Um, that contract has expired, so it's time to request proposals for lawn service for the coming season. And I have put the RFP in your packet, and it is essentially the same RFP that we usually use. Uh, we did tweak it slightly to include the story walk um, to make sure that that is being maintained properly. Um, we did suffer from a serious outbreak of poison ivy in our story walk last year. That's not the grounds crew 
that takes care of that though, that is Absolute Green, which is the company that handles the um, fertilization of the lawn. So just if you were thinking about that and, and remembering my conversation about the horrible case of poison ivy that we had, this group is not the one that takes care of that. So that's why it's not, not in the RFP. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, yeah, and it's, we um, budgeted it, budgeted this um, cost into the 2022 budget based on the 2021 season, so. Tweaked it, Probably up, we'll tweaked it up, up a little bit. Given that everything else is going up, their fuel costs and everything will be going up, but still yeah. it's, mm -hmm. It's Arlene, a starting point budget-wise, we can always adjust it later. So. Arlene took that into account and she tweaked it up a little bit. She did a really nice job with the budget this year in trying to kind of think through what would go up and what might stay the yeah. same. And, okay. and so I, I think she made some accommodations for it. But we can't well, especially always, because this was already a two-year contract. Yeah. So I, I, I would expect hopefully not a huge increase and maybe somebody else will come along that wants to pick up some new business and now mm -hmm. underbid it anyway. So. We can see how that plays out. But, uh, I, I move that we go ahead and issue the RFP for lawn services. Mm -hmm. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we approve the RFP for lawn maintenance for a two year period. And when will that go out? Um, Arlene will probably send out the next week or so. The goal would be to have you approve the contract at your next meeting, okay. um, either March or April. Um, to make sure that we've got it all figured out. So hopefully, if Mother Nature greens up the grass early this year, we'll be on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? No. If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Update on the repair of our exterior wall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, on December 1st, 2021, um, a car collided with the west wall of the library building, damaging an exterior wall through to the inside. This included damage to the frame on two windows, office furniture that was attached to the wall, and the computer that was on the desk. We've been working with the insurance adjuster assigned to the case by the library's insurance company, Michigan Municipal Risk Management. Um, due to the holiday season, as well as the high demand for construction contractors, um, securing estimates for the repair work has been somewhat challenging. We received two submissions. One was thorough and complete, and the other, while much lower, was missing significant aspects of the project, um, such as any consideration of electrical work and acknowledging and addressing the damage to the second window. Um, due to the more thorough and accurate assessment of the work that needs to be done, we would like to select MJ Shainer as the contractor to complete the work and are discussing with him ways to refine the quote, eliminating anything that can be done more efficiently. For example, because the library has extra carpet squares and ceiling tiles, the carpet and ceiling in the room can both be repaired instead of replaced. The next step is to get approval from the insurance adjuster to proceed with the work. The insurance company has been um, has reviewed the damage to the computer and the furniture. The computer has been replaced and the invoice will be um, submitted for reimbursement. It has been agreed that the desk can be replaced and um, reimbursed. Uh, so I did actually talk to the insurance adjuster today. Um, he was a little concerned that he thought that the quote was a, a little higher than what he wanted it to be, um, but he actually called the other insurance person at Michigan, and they had a conversation about it. He called me back shortly before the meeting and said um, it was actually within $5,000 of what his window was, um, and he said as long as we were working with him very carefully to, to assure that anything that didn't need to be done was taken out, um, that we could go ahead and proceed with this contractor. So, if it's oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I can then con contact um, Tim at um, MJ Shaner and let them know if that's um, okay with the board. Okay. So yeah. I will actually accept a motion to get this project underway. <laughs> I'll make a motion that we start to repair the outside brick and the inside damage to the building as of. December 1st, car collision. I second. It's been moved and seconded that we begin work to, working with the insurance adjuster to start this work. Any other questions or comments? 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion is approved. I have a simple question. Where is IRA Township? Where, where is this company? IRA Township? I don't even know where that is. IRA Township? Yeah. Um, I would have to look on the map to tell you exactly, but... Um, I've heard of it, but I don't... I can't place it. It's by St. Clair County. Oh, by St. Clair? Thank you. Thank you. An hour away. <laughs> if it's Marine City I Highway. Out of here, so I figured I'd look up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. For sure. A lot of drawings. Yeah. Um, and they were so small, I couldn't. I know. <laughs> so. But well, we mostly I put them in there so you know we had them. Not so much that I needed you to see them. Because they're full-size blueprints, but I wanted you to know that the, that the contractors were given the original as-built plans when they were determining how many layers there are to the wall. And so, I didn't expect you to go through <laughs> All right, let's move to number six. The review and approval of building project proposals dating back to 2020 or 2019. <laughs> We're going backwards in time here. <laughs> We're trying to drag all these projects into the present. Okay, um, so at the January um, 2022 meeting, uh, there was a presentation of several projects to work on in 2022. Four of these projects are ready for the library board to review and budgeting to be finalized so that we may proceed. Um, so they are the Teen Lounge, the Children's Area Book Nook, the director's office, and the community meeting room. Two of these projects, the team lounge and the community meeting room, were budgeted for 2020, but were deferred due to the pandemic and the funding reverted back to fund balance. The team lounge project now also includes additional funding from two generous donations in memory of people who would be pleased by an improved space for teens to enjoy at the library. The book nook project was inspired by the dedication of longtime friend of the library and avid book collector Deborah Locker. The initial project was intended to provide some cozy seating for children and their parents to enjoy together, but grew to include shelving that will also highlight special collections and embrace that cozy seating area with books to inspire families to read together, making it a wonderfully impactful statement in our youth area. The director's office was not a project that was here being considered. However, the damage is significant enough to require the replacement of some of the furniture. Expanding this project provides an opportunity to maintain the cohesive look of the office, rethink the space to allow for collaborative workspace, and repurpose pieces that do still coordinate with other office spaces in the building to be used in those spaces. So we're not actually getting rid of anything unless it's damaged. Um, but there are some um, uh, lateral file cabinets and things like that that would be greatly appreciated in other office spaces in the building and they do match those so instead of buying office um, pieces for those offices yeah. we will ship them into those and then we will buy ones for the director's office with everything coordinated yeah. um, so i think this is a it's a real opportunity to do some rearranging and, and to get everything that's supporting um okay so in terms of budgeting um, in 2020 due to the pandemic related limitations two hundred thousand dollars of the library's operating budget reverted back to fund balance this is an opportunity to reinvest those funds back into capital improvements in the library building um, so what i did was i created a little spreadsheet for you so and we can go over each um each one individually if you like but to start out the teen lounge which was budgeted project in 2020 was delayed due to the pandemic the original funding reverted to fund balance, so the original project was $30,000. The current proposed project budget is $29,875 as presented by Library Design Associates, and I do have some things that I can show you. Um, we won't, you're not approving the actual finishes, but I have some finishes to show you at the end of the meeting that, that you may like to see. Um, so library funding for this project would be $24,875, and then funding from other sources is $5,000. Um, and the requested budget adjustment would be um, $24,875. So the book nook, um, this is a reading area in the children's department in memory of Deborah Locker. Because donations are now covering some of the original teen lounge project, it is proposed to shift that savings to expand the book nook project. So part of what we were doing when we created that book nook project was to create this cozy seating for, for families. Um, the children's department would really like to have some additional shelving. Um, and so what we've, what library design has done for us is, is created this really 
nice seating area that has shelving along the back of it, um, making it this um, impactful piece right in the middle of the children's department. So um, while the memorials came for the furniture, the library would be essentially funding the shelving that goes along with it. It would all go together though, and um, this is an opportunity to do that since we have donations going toward the team space, and I'm just asking that we divert that money over to the children's department. It's really actually a nice thing because what we're, we were going to end up doing was something in the teen space and not in the children's space, and now we have the opportunity because of these generous donations to do something in both spaces with the limited amount of money from the library meeting to be investing in those projects. So, so in terms of the project, the original budget for the book nook is a $10,000 memorial donation. Um, the current proposed project budget is $16,850, which includes two L-shaped sofas and shelving to go around both of those as shown in the picture. Um, so the library funding um, would be $6,850. Funding from the other sources is $10,000. So a budget adjustment of $6,850 would be needed in order to cover the whole project. Um, so the director's office. So this is the, due to the car colliding with the library building. Um, the furniture was original to the building in 1992, so it will be difficult to coordinate new pieces to old. Um, and as I said, we're proposing replacing the furniture in the office to keep that space cohesive and then repurposing all those pieces that were not damaged to other uses in the building, which we actually, because we've hired some new staff and things like that, we were actually in the process of looking for some additional lateral files and some filing cabinets and things for those offices. <laughs> And now, so we'll have them. <laughs> I'm just going to call this a little bit of a blessing in disguise because now we'll be able to kind of move those pieces over and then just buy pieces all that go with one space. And so we won't have mismatched pieces all over. We'll have matching pieces in, in one place and matching pieces in another place. Um, the insurance will cover the cost of the desk that was damaged, uh, but they're not going to cover those lateral files and the table and chairs in, my, in the director's office right. as well. So. Um, so the lateral files that are in there would get moved. Um, so the total for that office is $7,950. The library would be funding $4,053. Um, the desk that would be replaced is $3,897, and that would be funded by insurance. So that would be $4,053 from fund balance. Um, so the community meeting room. This is actually a project that was budgeted in 2020, as well as the team space. Um, it was delayed due to the pandemic, um, and the original funding reverted to fund balance. This project proposes also purchasing six additional coordinating tables for the youth activities room to provide additional room arrangement possibilities in both spaces. So essentially what we did was we originally budgeted for this project at $80,000. Um, the current proposed project budget is 8223 That would all be library funding from fund balance. Um, so we would do a budget adjustment of 82123 so the total um, to do all of this is 117901 from fund balance, which is well below that 200 that reverted back um, to fund balance. This is a good way to invest in um, things for the library. So in terms of the teen lounge, um, and we did, a, we did talk about these various projects um, at the last meeting. Um, this one will look the same as what you saw at the last meeting. So this is um, the two peninsula shaped tables. Um, and 10 little rolling caster stools, a nice L-shaped couch, a nice square ottoman, um, and some display shelving. Um, it would also be recarpeting that room and repainting it as well um, to give it a whole fresh look. And I do have some carpet samples and things over here that I can show you. Uh, the book nook. So uh, as I said, the book nook um, is this piece in the middle, it's two L-shaped couches, and then um, wood shelving that goes around behind both of those, and it will be just shorter than the back of this couch. So it will be um, easily accessible by children. Um, it gives us lots of room to do displays. Uh, we will be using it to highlight some of our new books and our new collections. So we've um, expanded a bilingual collection. We are now doing a Spanish-speaking story time that is already very popular. Um, that was initiated by Molly Weiner, our new school um, outreach coordinator. So she's really excited about the possibility of highlighting that in this area so that people will see those books right away as they come into the children's department. The other nice thing about the way this is situated is that um, 
Stacia has been doing story times right in the middle of the children's department from time to time, which is really nice because it um, gives people who are coming into the library this sense of of the story time actually happening right there. It's not in a little room off to the side with the door closed. People who are in the library can enjoy it. Um, those people who maybe need a quieter space, we still have the Catal alcove, which is um, sort of sheltered from any sound. We have the conference room, we have the uh, business center and the study rooms. So doing these story times out in the middle library is just a really fun way to keep people engaged as they're coming into the building so that they're seeing the library being used. And this creates a really nice framework for people the parents can sit comfortably on these sofas and the performance is taking right in front of those nice big windows so. sounds like a wonderful <laughs> it's, it's, we're really excited about it we're really really excited about it um okay so the director's office um the current configuration was furniture that was attached to the wall this is actually a freestanding desk unit um, which allows for the room to be rearranged somewhat if need be um, and it also it takes out um, there is a lot of storage in that room that just collects things that it doesn't need to collect um, <laughs> because it's there and you have to fill because it. it's there and what i'm finding is in using the space is that the room was designed in 1992 when everything was on paper mm -hmm. but thanks to our fabulous administrative team we now digitize everything and so i have filing cabinets full of stuff that i no longer need anymore because we've digitized it all so i really think that by downsizing some of that storage space and then repurposing the room a little bit there's room for a little table where little meetings can take place and so I'm not necessarily sitting on one side of the desk having a conversation with somebody. We can sit at a separate table and it's a right. little more I, I, I noticed that right mm -hmm. away and I know mm -hmm. that's a nice Collaborative setup together. for, mm -hmm. you know, if one or two people are coming in for mm -hmm. a brief meeting or something. Mm -hmm. Obviously if you've got more people then you're going to want to use a conference room. but. Mm -hmm. But that's a nicer use, I think. It's a, ni it's a nicer use because it, it, it feels less like me sitting behind a desk if somebody comes in to talk to me, we can sit at a little table, we can have a nice conversation about whatever it is that we need to talk about, and, and I think it'll be a nicer configuration for that. It's a little better use of the space. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of storage in that room, and there's there's just lots and lots of shelves, and it just gathers all kinds of things that it doesn't even gather. So. It's a nice desk. It's nice, yeah, it's, 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 nice and, it's nice and solid if this happens again. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll not go flying. No, no. Anyway, that's me making light of a, of a difficult situation. Okay, so the community meeting room. Um, the community meeting room is actually, um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about this. Um, the tables that are in this room, um, the chairs that are in this room, everything is original to the 1992 building. In 2008, when we did space planning, we did carpet and paint. Um, but we did not do any, any furnish, furnishings in this room. So this is a proposal to redo those furnishings. That have, they've held up really well for 30 years, but we got the money. Now is the time to replace them because down the road, as they start to fall apart, if we don't make the investment now, we may not have the money. That's, good. That's one thing I've learned in this job is that Sometimes you got to go ahead and make that investment because there may come a time when you don't have the money and it needs to be done and then you don't, you're not able to do it. Um, so the chairs that we're looking at um, would be a similar stackable chair. Um, the tables that we're looking at are really um, I like the table. fabulous new technology. These are called pirouette tables. We have something similar in the conference room. The tables flip up and the feet turn in and then you can stack them straight out from the wall they roll they these, these tables don't have casters and they are heavy and solid but they are also <laughs> hard to move so um so this would be really nice and then of course the casters have locks on them so you can lock the tables into place wow so arlene and i work really hard to determine what we need and what we've determined is that we need 16 tables in this room um we currently only have nine there used to be a dozen tables in this room but they have been commandeered to other parts of the building and so we have never never actually had a dozen tables in this room <laughs> within, the, within the building opening those tables some of those tables got commandeered right away so we know we need 16 tables in order to do the various configurations that we do sometimes we need more so what she and i propose doing we do not have set tables in the youth activities room we propose buying six tables for these activities room at the same time that are coordinating tables 
and then we would be able to use them in here or in there depending on which room needs more tables. But there would be enough tables so that we theoretically could have meetings going on in both buildings or both rooms and be able to accommodate seating. Um, in terms of chairs, we believe that originally we had 150 stacking chairs over the course of time as they've broken. We have discarded them. We currently, thanks to the lovely inventory that Nicole has done for us, we have 113 remaining chairs. Um, 100 chairs is primarily what we, the max of what we use in this room. According to the fire department, we can have up to 206 chairs in here. Oh, Lord. Uh, that's not, that, I don't know how that number would even be possible. Really possible. I don't want to come to the meeting where there's that many no, chairs. No. <laughs> but Arlene and I kind of decided 100 chairs is the max she ever really does in this room. 80 is, is comfortable in here. Uh, we have done up to 100. Um, but then we also need some chairs in other parts of the building. So what we would assume we would need is um, about 20 extra chairs for the youth activities room, 10 extra chairs for the conference room. Um, the chairs stack in racks of 15. So we figure, okay, we'll put 15 in the youth activities room and 15 in the conference room and then the rest of them will live in this room. Um, so we've made some, some accommodations to, that, to those numbers as well. Um, this uh, proposal also includes the carpeting and the painting of this space. Any questions about any of the, uh, the projects or the way it's laid out or the cost? What's the matter, Nancy? I don't like these chairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, the chairs are here so you can try them. I actually have stable oh, chairs. They look better in person. And I was looking at, I like the picture much easier. But I think they look better in person, especially the white ones. Because this is like, yeah. Yeah. That color is a lot nicer than the picture. They actually brought us three chairs and we and the staff narrowed it down to this is their favorite. Um, and then there's also one that includes some padding, and you'll notice in the um, in the proposal there's there's a proposal for the regular stacking chairs that are not padded, and then there's a proposal for an additional dozen chairs, six per per stack, of some upholstered chairs that would be for the meetings like this. Oh, I like that much better. So so <laughs> it has been budgeted to do that. Um, what you'll need to do is sit in the chairs and make sure you like them. <laughs> And which is why I have the samples here this evening, so you can give them a try. They do look better in person. They do, yeah. They do, yeah. yeah. And I have some carpet squares over here, and I and I can show you those as well. I, I don't know that the public necessarily needs to watch you sitting in chairs and things like that. But, um, <laughs> after, the, after the meeting, we'll sit in chairs. Yeah, like carpet. You know, <laughs> decorating is fun. Yeah. No, no decisions will be made, but you you may um, definitely give us feedback on the chairs and the carpet squares and that sort of thing. As well, so. Any thoughts on color? Uh, the designer at Library Design actually did our space planning in 2008, and um, she is recommending, she, she's a, a gem um, in terms of doing color matching for our building. They have, our, they have everything from our space planning already. She has put um, three carpet squares over here that she feels coordinate with the building, but give us some flexibility to change this room a little bit. It has been pointed out, we have a lot of beige. And then it might be nice if we could get away from a bit of the beige. So what she has done is picked three carpet squares that would allow us to change up this room a little bit and maybe bring in some gray. Um, and so she is actually recommending um, the chair that she has selected is a gray chair with a black um, slate bottom on it. Uh, and then the carpet squares allow for um, the beige that goes with the woodworking, but also bringing in some gray to this room. And she's got a different color palette where there, it will still be dark on the bottom, lighter on the top, but she's going to change it out and give it a little more of a contemporary feel. So, that'd be nice. Mm -hmm. I'm really, I've always been very pleased with her. She, um, she actually did our space planning in 2008, and I was impressed because so much of our building in 1992 had been done with laminate tops that were very distinct. Kelly green, purple, you can see we still have green and purple chairs. Right. And it was all over the building, and we were all very tired of that color, but we did not have the money to swap all that out. And so she said, you know, what color do you want? And I said, I'm tired of seeing all the purple and green. What could you do to get those colors to recede? And, and she said, I can do that. And she said, what do you want to see? And I said, we have beautiful woodwork in this building. I want to see the woodwork. And so I left it in her capable hands, and that is exactly what has happened. She's been able to change the color palette so that we see the woodworking. We don't necessarily see the green and purple popping like it did before. 
um, the space planners rearranged the building and after we reopened the building, I actually had people who said, did you add windows? <laughs> no, we just rearranged everything. So <laughs> library design does a great job and um, in terms of the talent. This, this designer in particular, I think, um, is a magician with helping us to, to get the colors just right. So. And another thing to keep in mind is that the carpet squares currently in use in this room can be harvested mm -hmm. for replacement in the other parts of the library. Yes. That's one of the reasons we had them. Mm -hmm. So they can be utilized elsewhere. So we'll try to recycle and reuse. Arlene is very excited about that, by the way. As much as we can. <laughs> this is nice carpet here. Yes. 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 It's very nice carpet. It's been a nice mm -hmm. pattern. And the, mm -hmm. the brand of carpet that she is recommending is the same brand of carpet, which has held up incredibly well. Oh, yeah. Um, I do have some um, pictures to show you on the screen that will show that the squares over here can be done in different patterns, and that we'll be able to choose that. You can do them. So that a lot of them have lines in them and you can do them so they're linear so that they look like little stripes or you can turn them 90 degrees and they get sort of a little bit of a checkerboard feel makes the room so there's different things that we can do with those and she's very happy to help us pick that as well oh that's nice so we have a lot of flexibility with what we decide okay we feel we're ready for a motion we, since we have discussed this several times over the last couple of years <laughs> refining as we go, right? So, essentially all we need is a motion to approve proceeding with the plan based on tonight's presentation. Yep. So we I'll make that motion. <laughs> second. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. All right. So it's been moved and seconded to approve a budget adjustment of $117,901. Isn't that specific? <laughs> well, we're, we're doing, I, um, I would recommend two Oh, two different motions. motions. You have one to approve the four proposals from library design and okay. one to move them. Right. Okay. I crossed that off already. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got a little ahead of myself. Well, that's All okay. right. So it's been moved and seconded that we approve the four proposals presented by library design as presented. Any other comments about that? No. 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 Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion is passed. Now the funding. Okay, now I'll accept a motion for funding these projects. I move to approve a budget adjustment of $117,901 from fund balance to 971 building to fund these projects. 975. 975. Uh, what did I say? You said one. Well, we got ones on the brain. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was going to get it. No, you didn't. I'll second it, Alice. I did that with that one comment. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it now has been moved and seconded that we approve a budget adjustment of $117,901 from fund balance to line 975 building to fund these projects. Any comments or questions about that? The only comment is under our original budget two years ago. Yes. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay. That Thank you very much. Motion is passed. This could be kind of an exciting year. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 That's the intention. <laughs> yeah, and nice visible projects, which yes. is always good. Yeah. I think the public will really like what we're about to do. Yeah. I think so All right, and at that time, and now I will accept the motion for June. So moved. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion is passed, and we will adjourn at 725. Thank you, Alice.